Have you crossed paths with uh, Apollo GraphQL? Yeah, I, I've worked, I use their uh, open source software quite a bit. So you say open source. My understanding is Facebook created GraphQL and now Apollo is adding some servicing on top of it to bring it to the enterprise, is that right? Well, uh, GraphQL is a protocol, okay? So it, it, GraphQL is an alternative to the REST protocol, where in REST you use like, you know, the HTTP verbs, right? The methods of get, please give me information, post, usually to send information, sometimes put, delete, usually means to go get rid of something. And the idea was sort of create a semi-standard for how you could work with data over, over networks. The truth is REST doesn't really mean what it says because everybody can implement it however they want to. Uh, and you actually have to read the docs to find out how the whole thing works. Facebook found this to be somewhat limiting, especially for the more complicated shapes of data they were looking to get for their processes. And they, they kept on veering away from REST principles into what you call ad hoc form formats of data saying, hey, I'm asking a very particular question, please give me my answer. And they start creating more and more and more of these endpoints. The idea behind GraphQL is that you actually have one endpoint where you can ask it a more complicated structured question, which is the GraphQL formatting of the query. And, and you can run multiple queries inside a single transaction. Right, so you can say, well, well, I'm gonna do my call, I'm gonna run this query and this query and this mutation, where like the mutation is equivalent of a write or an update type action, uh, something you might do with a post, uh, whereas a query is something you would do with a get. And by having it composable, right, like books, like you have in this example here, books can contain authors. Authors, frankly, can contain other books. You can ask, okay, give me all the books associated with the author of this book, right, just by passing in the first book. So by having a query, it's as give me this book and then composing the shape of the answer you want, you can find out about all the related books. And you don't have to know in advance all the ways people would use your system as long as you have your types in what's called your schema set up. Mm -hmm. That's the standard. And that's a standard that Facebook kicked off. But that standard is only as useful as the software that supports it. And you're gonna need software on two sides of the house, right? Need software on the client side that has responsibility for, you know, figuring out how to compose that query and also how to get the data on the other side. And you're going to need a software on the server side that can receive these queries service them uh, and send back whatever the information is you're looking for and also taking on the actions. So uh, Apollo provides software that's on both sides of this. They provide client software and they provide server side software. And it's all, everything I've seen from them software wise has been open source. And they have kind of a, to my understanding, kind of a classic open source model where you can be getting their stuff and using it on whatever every LGPL or MIT license they have. And you can also get a second license if you want it that will also include some degree of support and some degree of allowing for modification without having to redistribute. And that's sort of a classic open source way of doing these things. So say I wanted to leverage GraphQL sans Apollo. Is it a standard or are these, are these uh, managed libraries that I would download and incorporate? GraphQL is solely a standard. What you're gonna find as you dig into GraphQL is that there are a few different libraries that you could get that will help you do more. And there's some libraries that are actually supported by the GraphQL Foundation. A lot of it has to do with tooling. You know, being able to like read a schema, you know, convert it into TypeScript types, that kind of thing, which I use. Those are fantastic. And then there's uh, software both on the client side and on the server side. Some which is like on the, on the client side, it's there's stuff that's written. The JavaScript, uh, as well as Java and Kotlin for the uh, Android use or Swift or Objective-C for like, you know, iOS use, right? because it's whoever's going to be on the client side of the house, as well as I think PHP. And then on the server side, you know, software that will receive those requests in these different languages as well. Now, Apollo, to my knowledge, is like one of the most popular. Relay is another open source package uh, that is pretty popular in this regard. Urkel, U-R-Q-L, humorously named one. Uh, that is also, I think they're just client side. There's a great managed service I make a lot of use of called AppSync uh, by uh, AWS, where they actually will host the whole server side. And all I need to do is create lambdas that link to those um, link to those endpoints as data providers. So I can feed AWS the GraphQL schema as well as hey here here's where I want my code to be involved, and it just kind of takes care of the rest, which is pretty magical. That means I very rarely have to deal with server side considerations for this. And there are others, right? There's something called Prisma, which is a form of directly wiring your GraphQL to your database. There's something called Hasira, which allows you to just have a PostgreSQL database and look create a GraphQL on top of it. 8Base is a low-code uh, system that is also GraphQL-based. Yeah, it's not just Apollo. Okay, so, so in addition to, it seems like the new paradigm they're introducing, like moving from the 
the REST standard to query standard. Is there anything new on the tech front that they introduce um, or is it still standard HTTP, XHR or fetch? Like, is there any, cause I've seen some, like, are they leveraging service workers? Does it incorporate any new um, web technology or anything like that? I mean, you can have subscriptions uh, that allows you to use sockets to be, uh, for example, you can go ask a query and then you can you have a socket that is you know, informing you when there are changes to your data, right? So that you can be keeping up to date on more of a live basis. And you know, you could use like web sockets for that or just use polling for that or whatever. But, but all of this will work out of the box with a standard browser and that was one of the design principles they had. It's just a way of going from having N endpoints, right? Cause I used to like in a REST world, I would have, you know, like if you look at Swagger documentation, I could have like dozens of endpoints, right? To having the one endpoint a more complex query that I can compose within it. The things I've noticed is it's it's not just for web. They also use it on their native applications. And what, what's interesting is um, what I've noticed is a lot of the um, scripting that I do is to pull like things like the endpoints um, and the status codes. And sometimes I'll combine those to create like a unique string. And that's interesting to see how those trend over time to determine things like timeouts and 400s and stuff like that. GraphQL many times uses the same exact endpoint. So that doesn't give me any information. Many times uses the same status code. It's always a 200. 100. Yep. Yeah, so that- You want to add narrows to it, yep. Right, so my object, my job has been recently to um, write a fetcher Ajax hook to analyze the payload. And what I've been gathering that has been useful is what's called the operation name. Usually that's, uh, kind of like maps with what it's trying to do, like customer lookup, et cetera. But there's probably more I could do on that front. So this company is also an insight company. So they have the same principal investor as Quantum. And the, the director of customer success reached out to me. She's ex Google, you know how I feel about that. I've never worked for a company that has built their product around open source. Is that a good model? Can be. I mean, certainly your investors think so, right? True. The 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 question is like where's the where's the leverage, right? I tend to think that there are two ways that a company can really create value, right? Uh, and that's gonna be through what I might call their hard assets and their soft assets. Their hard assets are the things they own that somebody else can't have, right? So like for an oil company, this might be their rights uh, to certain pieces of land, right? They get to get the oil out, they, they have whatever their arrangements are, that's how they're gonna get to make their money. For an intellectual property company, uh, like software company, often that's just in their software. Now, the sticky bit is most software companies don't have intellectual property that's worthy of the name. Uh, they've just got, um, they don't really have anything that's patentable, they're just sort of doing their thing. And they sort of pretend that they are, and they talk about how they got this proprietary software, blah, 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 blah. But the truth is, whatever they have, even the thing that's a bit proprietary has a very short shelf life because it's not really built on patent patents um, that are protectable uh, just beyond the current you know, value of the immediate instance of what they built, right? Like, hey, I've got this piece of software. Boy, this thing seems to work right now. Well, you know, wait two weeks, right? It'll require maintenance, whatever. And if you don't have also the people who are backing that up, it's not worth very much. And in the meantime, everybody else is catching up because there's not a, there's not a moat around it in the form of that kind of you know, legal or you can't have it protection. So you're left with the soft asset. And the soft asset most often is going to be brands. And, and I, I really like substituting the word reputation, right? Um, what is the reputation of Apollo? And their marketing strategy is that they go, they, they send their DevRel people. Uh, and Peggy Rezus is a, um, a, a engineering manager over at Apollo. She had a long career as a DevRel person before that. Uh, and I've seen her speak and she just goes and talks to developers and talks basically about how GraphQL is awesome. That doesn't even need to be pitching Apollo in particular, right? But that just like sort of brings them into the cult. They get to use the open source stuff. They're finding it relatively easy to use. And then they're going to companies and they are skilled already with GraphQL and with Apollo. And that means for their employer, oh, maybe we should be using this. But if we're gonna be using this, we're gonna need some degree of support for it, right? There needs to be a throat to choke. There needs to be what happens when our complicated company is hitting things that like this technology isn't quite ready for. And we're not ready to wait in line for all of that open source stuff to happen, right? Because open source is great because it's free and it's terrible because it's slow.